Um, hello there, my name is Steve Kaizi Mgerwa. I'm uh, the uh, acting um, uh, chief economist and vice president of uh, the African Development Bank. I've been newly named so. Uh, previously, I was the director for the research department. Before that, I was director for policy. Before that, I was director for East Africa, lead economist. Uh, that is at the bank. Uh, in other places, I've worked at the uh, IMF. I've also worked at, uh, at WIDA of the United Nations, based in Helsinki, but uh, mainly I was an academic uh, teaching and doing research as an associate professor at the University of Gothenburg. So I'm extremely happy to be uh, receiving your on, uh, this online interview. I um, will begin by telling you a bit about what has been happening here in Addis Ababa. We, uh, this uh, few days ago, brought together a whole lot of uh, people from all over the world, re really, but mainly African researchers and policy makers, including vice chancellors of universities, to study the important issue of uh, knowledge and innovation uh, for uh, st structure transformation in Africa. We thought that uh, we should have this year, you know, these conferences take place every year. They, call, they are called the African Economic Conference. We thought that for this year, we would try very much not for, for, uh, follow the usual path of discussing poverty, maybe, or, or industrial, industrialization, or even agricultural development, and look at some issues that are intrinsic to, uh, to the upliftment of Africa uh, in the sense of knowledge. And this is, of course, related very closely to the digital revolution that you see, the, uh, the mobile telephone and so on, but also the role of university research, the role of university education. Are all these things going are capable? Are they going to be able to push the African economy to where we want it to be? So the issues of um, structural transformation. We have already had incredibly good sessions. The first one was attended by Madame Azuma, who is, of course, the chairperson of the African uh, Union Commission. We also had uh, Dr. Lopez, who is uh, the uh, uh, executive director or executive secretary of the Economic Commission for Africa. We had representatives from the UNDP and, of course, ourselves from the ADB. So I think I'm ready now to receive your questions. Uh, okay, there's a very interesting question here about the impact of the bank's return to its headquarters in terms of losing its skilled manpower or the knowledge base. Uh, anecdotal evidence suggests that the best and brightest have left the bank due to the not so attractive living conditions that have recourse. Do you agree with me? Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I didn't quite uh, get where that... Okay, it comes from the African Observer online. I must say very emphatically that actually that is wrong. Uh, we, uh, we thought we would lose quite a few people, obviously, some people who were in Tunis because of their proximity to Europe, I want it to be that, or others that thought that uh, uh, Abija was uh, too, too far off the beaten path to, to, to be interesting for career reasons. But uh, we were surprised that a lot of people uh, uh, have moved to Abidjan. Uh, you say the brightest, uh, the best and brightest uh, are there, including our media people, the same people, and so on. So it is actually astounding that in a period, a very short, short period of time, we managed to bring everybody into, uh, into our headquarters. Um, uh, okay, the headquarters building is not quite ready, but the government of Cote d'Ivoire put at its disposal a very huge building that is accommodating a lot of our staff. I would really say that in terms of competencies, in terms of what we can do, we are pretty much at the same level of ambition and ability that we were at in Tunis. Okay, so uh, thank you so much, South China Morning Post, that the World uh, Food Program has lashed out at chi China's billionaires saying 
their contributions behind their company's huge economic interests in the region hit by Ebola. Do you think China and its farms have done enough financially to help? Uh, I think one should, um, should probably step back a little bit and say that uh, the Ebola uh, issue is quite complex. It took everybody by uh, surprise a little bit. Uh, we know that Ebola was a problem. In Uganda it killed only about 100 people. Uh, in Zaire it killed less. Uh, and so when you put it all together, the m numbers and the, uh, the, the rap rapid uh, impact that it had on the region is quite astounding. Now to just sort of isolate the Chinese billionaires might be uh, uh, a mistaken uh, approach, I think. I think what one needs is a much more wholesome uh, uh, approach to, to the issue. Uh, what I think is even more important is the fact that we all sort of missed the boat. The, um, the countries themselves, it just exposes how little they have been putting in building institutions. Uh, the neighbors uh, were initially, as you remember, very uh, extremely sensitive. They closed borders and by doing so, the, even the medicines and, uh, and the stuff that would help did not reach the countries. Uh, some traders, international traders, uh, trading organizations stopped that. Boats did not dock in, uh, in all this Monrovia and so on. So it's a little more, uh, but of course it's a little easier to bash the billionaires. But I don't know if, um, they should do more, but I won't really isolate them as the major culprits at all. Uh, okay. Uh, okay, so there is a very long question here that I need to read a bit. African Observer asking about uh, whether our uh, economic surveillance uh, and modeling uh, goes beyond collecting data through a statistical unit. Um, okay, that, that in recent years the African economies have grown both in size and sophistication a number of African economies are, tap are tapping into the global financial markets. And uh, these entail risks and opportunities. Does the bank have any analytical framework to analyze these risks and opportunities? Does the bank have a technical skills to analyze the impact of the different shocks? Uh, okay, and of course, by shock, I'm referring to the recent price oil decline, Ebola outbreak, and the rise in sovereign bonds, and so on. Uh, I must say that, um, that, thank you for that question. I must say that we do have increasing and very, uh, maybe going back a little bit, but during the presidency of President Kabaruka, we uh, as a bank have really raised our profile quite a bit. Uh, our, our brand has risen. One of the products that we do every year is the so-called African Economic Outlook, which we do with the OECD uh, and the UNDP. Uh, that has become sort of the report to read on Africa every year. It covers a, a host of issues on the ground, but specifically referring to shocks, external shocks, that is what it's meant to do uh, on an annual basis. But of course shocks come not one every year, they come a little more frequently. So we do have products within the bank, and if you kindly check our website, you'll find we do monthly analysis, but also do internally uh, weekly analysis of what is happening. And we have been very concerned lately of the impacts of uh, quantitative easing, for example, those we have looked at, the impact of, of oil prices. And uh, one of the things that we have said out there is that uh, it might have, um, or, or rather specifically, the impact of, uh, of iron ore. That has been a big one. There has been a report there on the, by The Economist, which uh, seems to think that we have come to the end of the iron age and prices have gone so far down that uh, they have very negative repercussions for, for, for some African countries. We do feel that that might be the case, but we also believe that since Africa is going through its own industrialization, and the industrialization is normally powered by, by, uh, by iron and steel, that that might have some kind of ameliorating impact itself. Uh, it has gone off. Hello? It's sort of disappeared. I think there was a power problem. Yeah.
Uh, we are still on. We are still on. You are still on. There was a power problem here. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, <coughs> so, in terms of, uh, uh, again, the Africa Observer Online and incoming chief economist, what are your priority research agendas? Uh, okay. Uh, one, the very fact that uh, I'm, um, I'm uh, acting uh, implies a little bit that uh, I have sort of newly come in and uh, what I can do at best is to sort of, uh, uh, sort of uh, preserve the momentum of the past chief economist. And then I'll, let me just say what we were doing and then I'll tell you a bit more about what I think are very important issues that I want to pursue uh, moving ahead. But uh, so we have been very interested in studying the middle class of Africa because everybody has indicated that that is, that, that is going to be uh, where the dynamics will come from. Because everywhere, the middle classes, of course, spend a little more. The middle class is ambitious in terms of seeing to it that standards of education and of, of governance uh, are higher than average. And the middle classes also try to spend, they travel, they bring in new ideas for reform and for transformation and innovation. So th those are very ce central to it. So we have been studying the middle classes uh, on one side, but also have tried to not leave others behind. So inclusion has been one area that we have studied. Natural resources, every other country seems to be discovering oil or gas in Africa. So natural resources has been something that we have tried to pursue very, uh, very closely. But uh, for me, I do think also uh, lately uh, with a group of my own staff, we have worked on urbanization in Africa, which I think is a big, 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 uh, going to be a big driver of development and growth in Africa already today. Uh, the, the mega cities are really having not only uh, an economic impact but also a political impact. Look at Abidjan, uh, five to seven million people. Look at uh, all these big cities, Accra, Nairobi, and so on. But one thing I keep telling people is that uh, you go to these cities, they're becoming quite sophisticated. Little Manhattans, little Parises, and so on, little Londons. But uh, after one week uh, of rain, the cities are unrecognizable. They all drown in the, in the rain seasons uh, and so on. Why? It's because we have focused mainly on top of the cities and there's been very little uh, emphasis or looking at what lies below. So while you have modern structures up on top, below the structures are really 50 years old. And so, hence, with the rain, there the are no sewage systems, there are no drainage systems, the, uh, it's really pretty much chaos. So it's like building on sand, mainly. So I think that while you see the movement of people into cities, you're also going to have uh, a whole lot of, of problems. So it's about time that one systematically tried, while promoting infrastructure, which our bank does very well, that we also promote the development of the underground structures in all our cities. So that's one area uh, for the moment, apart of course from the constant monitoring of the macro issues that arise uh, around the African economy. Okay, very good. The main findings of the African Economic Out Outlook for 2014, uh, well, let me first say this, that the African Economic Outlook for 2014 uh, is revolving around uh, value chains. The, uh, the, uh, the fact that uh, Africa, whether it wants it or not, will be involved or should be involved in global value chains. And simply put is that uh, uh, um, uh, production today in the world today is no longer confined to one country. It's n Japan no longer produces uh, all these gadgets that you have alone. Japan might do the mother motherboard of a computer, the screen might be made in Taiwan, the buttons might be made elsewhere. So we as African countries need to, uh, to begin to, to take advantage of cost advantages, proximity to the market. One country that has done that very well is Morocco, which has um, uh, an uh, active uh, um, uh, industry that produces spare parts and different uh, components of vehicles for, for cars in, 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 in for, global, uh, for global conglomerates, uh, the Renault car especially in France and so on. 
But uh, there is a problem there uh, in our report that we highlight, is that um, global value chains might at the same time kill regional value chains. Why? Because regions in Africa, uh, East Africa for example, could be able to produce certain things within the region that might not necessarily be inputs in the global uh, economy per se, but that need to develop if you want quietly within the region before they, uh, they, they, they are good enough to be exported. But nevertheless, uh, the thinking and the main conclusion of that part of the report is that Africa needs in various ways to start developing its own uh, involvement in the global value chains in the world economy. Uh, uh, th uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, again, asking about uh, how long it might take for the Ebola hit nations to, repair, to recover economically from the crisis. Uh, what I say, <coughs> what I say to a lot of my friends when we are discussing Liberia, Ghana, and um, ra rather not Ghana, Guinea, uh, Liberia, Guinea, and um, and uh, Sierra Leone, is that um, these are countries that were really just beginning to, to, to recover. So when you talk about uh, uh, when do they recover, they are beginning to recover from decades of uh, disruption, of fighting, of internecine warfare. So they were just beginning to recover when this thing hit them. So there are two types of recoveries. Recovering to where they were and then recovering to from the war. In other words, becoming normal, well-functioning economies. All these processes will really, really take time. The first set of recovery, getting Ebola behind them, will obviously take a much shorter time. I would imagine, and they're, hap they're happy signs, and of course one has to be cautious, but they're happy signs that uh, the, 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 the crisis is leveling off and maybe seeing numbers of uh, infections falling off a little bit. So if that happens in the next uh, couple of months, then we should see uh, involvement back in commerce and so on. And the, all these economies are starting from a very low base. So even uh, simple improvements in transport links and in the supply of services, the return of normality will probably help to get uh, things going pretty quickly. But for economies really to recover, because they are reconstructing, I mean imagine uh, Monrovia doesn't have electricity, that is a capital city, it doesn't have permanent sources of electricity and so on. Those kind of things will take much longer to, 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 to be in place. But I think the recovery itself, returning back to, to where they were a few months ago, might take much shorter period of time. Of course I don't believe uh, that like the, uh, the the World Bank estimated that whole region will lose 35 billion uh, US dollars. Uh, of course, that report has a lot of disclaimers saying that the numbers might be off or we don't have the right information here and there. But obviously, the international press just took the number and started spinning it around. So 35 billion is way out, I would think. But uh, there's definitely going to be some cost to all this, especially <coughs> the cost of rumor and fear and so on is probably much greater than, uh, uh, than, than otherwise. Uh, well, thank you again. Uh, we, um, again, on the African uh, Economic Outlook, whether we have uh, been, uh, uh, we have reduced our our uh, 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 our um, uh, up updates of the growth forecast for for many African countries, we um, we certainly feel that there's been a, a bit of a drop off. Uh, we have some internal numbers which haven't released, but uh, we we don't think that uh, the tapering off was uh, as, uh, as as great because performance has uh, improved a little bit towards the end of the year. Uh, the Ebola factor, as I was saying uh, just a while ago, is uh, obviously the, the human element is grim uh, by, no, by all means, is, uh, but I, I would imagine that the impact is uh, a little smaller than the speculation out there, especially because uh, you remember the economies of, of these three countries 
a very missing portion of uh, of uh, the production in the West African region. But but also, of course, there are countries like Cote d'Ivoire were affected. But uh, we are in Cote d'Ivoire, and uh, the economies are really uh, fully recover, fully moving on. And I think that ultimately the impacts might not be as uh, as as big as feared. Okay, a very good question about infrastructure and uh, the participation of the private sector is still lagging behind. Uh, uh, and what can, we, what can be done to, to incentivize the private sector? What is, it ho what is holding it back? <coughs> uh, thank you so much. I, um, uh, you see, the private sector lives <laughs> pretty much by its own rules and um, sometimes one is surprised. Uh, for example, a country where the private sector, technically, uh, for many years people said that DRC is a place where the private sector will not, will not be. Uh, and then others say, well, uh, Nigeria is a place where the private sector won't be for a host of reasons. But these are countries where the private sector is, is, uh, is uh, actually involved in a big way and uh, with investments of billions of U.S. dollars. So the private sector is fickle and actually sometimes it's very difficult to predict. But what I think is that, generally speaking, the, the, uh, they need a bit of leadership, regional leadership, I would imagine. You can see already that the private sector is investing increasingly steadily in East Africa, for example, because one, you have a hub around Nairobi, and there's a flow over now to a bit of Kampala, of course, uh, Kigali, and that region. So you probably need uh, regional critical mass if you want. Uh, the same for Southern Africa, then flows a little bit around. The same for Nigeria. You have Nigeria where they are there in a big way, and then flows maybe also to a, a bit, although mainly in, 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 uh, in uh, energy related infrastructure in Ghana and so on. So um, uh, the individual countries have done, to my mind, as, as much as they could to get the, the, uh, the private infra uh, uh, investors I involved. Uh, mainly uh, a lot of uh, the Asian, the Chinese, uh, the Indians have really taken the clarion call and have come in a big way and we are beginning to see a lot of Western interest coming in. A bit of it uh, sort of investigation and looking around uh, in the first instance. But uh, nobody quite believes that uh, the private sector will stay away. I think the attractions are way too big out there. And uh, especially given, in spite of the, the possible recoveries, Europe, for example, is still not where it should be in terms of performance. And uh, there is definitely uh, uh, a need to, to find other markets. And Africa is that, uh, that, uh, that alternative, a powerful alternative at that. Ah, okay, so somebody has asked me here about why it's so difficult to obtain loans in African nation, national banks, I think that is the question. And this question is from Nigeria. Um, well, I, I think that's a question that is actually has also uh, uh, academic research uh, curiosity. Uh, for example, today the interest rates, well, what you, the return on the uh, on the uh, on the treasuries, uh, the U.S. treasuries, is somewhere below one percent, and yet um, uh, African uh, uh, commercial banks are lending. Some of them are, are lending at twenty percent in situations where inflation is below five percent. So you are having a real interest return of fifteen percent. That ultimately breaks uh, the bulk of business. Uh, and so um, I would imagine uh, there is still latent fear of uh, poor, leg le uh, poor legislation, poor ability to, to get money back from those that have borrowed, poor uh, registration of borrowers. Uh, in a lot of places you can't quite follow borrowers because there is no name law. Uh, somebody can actively undertake business uh, under 10 names and, uh, and then very easy to to move around, some borrow from one country to the other. So there are still those kind of risks. But 
and the bank has done a lot of uh, work on this, is it has uh, encouraged and in some cases uh, provided grants to governments to establish what they call credit bureaus. Now, credit bureaus are very important in that they register you and they register what you have borrowed. And so you become, uh, you become traceable in the system. So when you come again and try to borrow, th then you'll be tracked down. But that is also uh, depends on uh, the, uh, the presence of a central registry for the whole population in the country so that they can very easily check on your identity, your address, and so on. So there are a few things to do. Uh, in Europe, you know when somebody... Uh, that when you have an identity, you know exactly where somebody lives, you know what their telephone number is, you know, uh, you know when they are their age and so on, you know their credit history. That is not always possible to obtain in Africa, and hence the insecurity, and hence the high costs, or uh, uh, inability to borrow cheaply. Okay, Th thank you, thank you so much. Thank you so much for that question. Whether the bank has uh, supports has a framework to support uh, uh, the new uh, oil and gas uh, f uh, countries that have received oil, new oil and gas, I happen to be. I'm very happy you asked that question. We have a facility which has become very important. It's like it was waiting for 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 for, for the boom, the oil and gas boom in Africa, and that facility is called the African Legal Support Facility. Uh, it was initially created to address the issues of, uh, of loan sharks. Uh, you remember after the HIPIC, when the debts were forgiven, some uh, people out in, uh, in various countries went and bought the, the debt while it was still very cheap, and have waited until there's some bit of recovery, and they're trying to get back those debts at the original pricing. So some of them are bound to make a real killing and so on. So. This legal facility, among others, was set up to try and assist countries out of these problems. But now it has broadened to much more interesting areas, I think much more productive areas for Africa in, in any case. And what they are looking at is the kind of legislation that, uh, that, uh, that, can, that African countries, uh, uh, or rather contracts that African countries are, are signing under. Because, uh, as you know, once you discover oil, there's all, all sorts of expectations uh, that go up in the country, but um, uh, and the governments are almost willing to sign anything to ensure that they begin to cash in. Uh, but as a result, a lot of the contracts that they have been signing have not been uh, up to 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 to, to standard, and sometimes have trapped the uh, have trapped essentially slave contracts have been signed, and so we are helping countries to to reverse some of those or even more important to advise them before they sign on the most uh, the best ways to get uh, the, the the most out of their natural resources uh, including beneficiation including uh, 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 various aspects of uh, of downstream uh, activities Okay, so my, uh, the question from uh, somewhere from South Africa is, uh, is, uh, is ADB, uh, uh, um, um, okay, uh, whether the ADB is working on uh, major reforms that can assist economies to become financially stable? Okay, uh, that's a very good uh, uh, question also. But you see, I think what the ADB has done, uh, very interestingly, is that it works with others. Uh, if the ADB was working alone. There's no way that it could handle the many <laughs> millions of issues that arise in Africa. So we do definitely work with others. It's gone off again, I think. No, you are, you are on. Yeah. You are on. We, we are still on from this end? Because the picture yes. seems to be off. Or maybe it goes off every so often. Okay. Well, you are on. We'll let you know I'm if there on. is a problem. Okay, so you know a okay, so you let me know. So even if it goes blank, I was getting used to looking at my own picture, but okay. So I'll go on. You are you there? Hello. Yes, we are all yeah. there. No worries. Oh, okay, okay, okay. So, right. Um, 
uh, okay, now I've lost my, the trend of my, uh, our, yeah, South Africa. South Africa wondered whether the bank supports uh, reforms that would uh, make economies financially stable. And what I, was, what I was saying is that we do a whole lot of things with others, uh, in collaboration with others, in packages of reform and so on. But one particular uh, thing that we do, we have a department at the bank called the Governance Department. But actually what it does is a lot of, of uh, macroeconomic support work. And uh, it also is the department that works on, on budget support. And as you know, uh, before you offer budget support in the kind of programs that um, the IMF supports as well, you first have to make sure that the government has undertaken those reforms that ensure that that budget support will be used well. So you look at the fiscal aspects of the economy, you look at... Um, the state of the banking industry, you look at uh, regulatory reforms within, uh, within the country and also the state of the private sector. So we definitely do, uh, but, uh, uh, we do support financial reforms. There's also, there are also times when, we, uh, when we, uh, we go out to just support the financial sector itself, especially on the regulatory side and uh, especially uh, legislation, for instance, for uh, introduction of micro, the, mic the micro sector into the, the more global situation of that country. Uh, I must say that uh, the, bank, the bank has recently set up uh, a financial sector department. This is very new. And that department has two pillars. One of them is financial deepening. So in other words, helping countries like, for example, the... Um, uh, creating uh, stock exchanges or making them uh, work better, those kind of platforms, or doing other things that will help to deepen the markets, which are relatively thin at the moment, help them to deepen. Another one is another pillar is also to ensure that the people that are marginalized are not banked, are not part of the banking system, are brought in through, for example, improvements in how microfinances operate, but also other avenues, like, for instance, the new. Uh, uh, mobile f uh, mobile financing uh, opportunities that have arisen with the digital revolution in that area, the Mopesa in Kenya, and so on. So definitely, we uh, the bank is doing a whole lot of things to 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 ensure that um, uh, uh, that that African economies have that stable finance. But as you know, uh, when we talk about Africa, we tend to of course think of Africa as a country, but it's not. So the needs from the bigger economies of Nigeria, of South Africa, of Egypt, and so on, are, are quite different from the smaller economies of the Gambia and, uh, and Burundi and so on. But all of them definitely desire stability uh, of the finances and uh, the macro stability. The, the, uh, 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 nobody can tolerate um, uh, inflation today, even if they're small countries. <coughs> Okay, so thank you so much, Christian uh, Science Monitor. That wonders whether um, uh, uh, these uh, three economies that we talked about, Sierra Leone, Liberia, and Guinea, have been, of course, mm -hmm. hit hard by Ebola. But I, I, I mentioned even then that they were sort of unique, these countries. In fact, they have been hit hard because they already were suffering quite heavily. We we're only trying very slowly to, to get back to normal following years and years of disruption. In the case of Liberia and Sierra Leone, uh, an in incredible, incredibly long civil war. Uh, so I uh, think that uh, other African countries, uh, uh, East Africa, for example, is doing quite well. Uh, we cannot quite predict what, uh, how they could resist shocks or what type. Uh, but I would imagine that they would stand a better chance of resisting shocks. Uh, central uh, the uh, the countries around Sadiq, for example, uh, why is because they seem to have a much uh, a much uh, they have developed institutions during these past 20 years. They have uh, withstood uh, crises, which they seem to have uh, been able to handle reasonably well. They have developed a reasonable middle class with uh, with uh, a bit of uh, management ability, with a bit of money, with a bit of investment out there. And um, and they are managing very 
slowly to claw back the, the importance of of donor aid in their economy, so they're very much depending on their own on their own capacities to 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 to, to, to finance uh, their development uh, projects going forward. Um, so, but 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 uh, but uh, but uh, but resistance to shocks really basically depends on uh, some kind of uh, strength of the government itself uh, looking forward, uh, being um, being uh, flexible but also uh, being uh, uh, able to look beyond just the immediate uh, um, and also uh, benefiting from the boom. So East Africa again has done very well by trying to invest this or that boom into, 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 into their own economies. <coughs> so now I'm afraid I'm <laughs> sort of losing my voice. So I'm wondering if uh, maybe we can take two, two more questions and then call it a day. Uh, okay. So, um, okay, very, very good question uh, from the China Morning Post about uh, the fate of the African elephant and, uh, and whether, uh, whether there's cooperation across the nations, uh, including China. On, uh, on, on reducing the diamond. Now I saw the other day there is actually um, uh, an advert uh, running uh, and uh, it includes an, an, uh, an uh, I believe Chinese, uh, uh, definitely Chinese looking uh, lady that is uh, advertising and that is involved in an anti and really uh, poaching campaign. Uh, uh, I would say that um, uh, there is quite, there is uh, increasing concern over this, because uh, I, I think the concern has a reason. Because I, uh, a lot of people thought that the battle had been won, uh, and that uh, it would be, uh, it would. But the ver the, lo the, the, veloc the, the ferocity with which uh, the af uh, the animals are being killed today has risen concern across the board uh, about where, where it's going to end. Actually, so much that countries are really moving uh, animals using helicopter and other means to sanctuaries. And, uh, and so that definitely is reaching uh, those kind of almost epidemic proportions. And countries, at least African ones, are very, very concerned that uh, uh, this should not continue, that, the, that this animal, uh, one of the most powerful uh, ones in, 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 in the African fauna, uh, should not be allowed to uh, to die out. Uh, whether uh, global cooperation is, c there is a lot of talk also at the global level, but of course, as they say, uh, the, the cake is, uh, the, the sooner so the cake is in the eating, and the eating is not quite happening. There's a lot of talk, but I, I don't think uh, there's uh, equivalent action taking place as far as I know. Okay, now that's a very good question about uh, the African countries, and we have quite a number, Zambia, uh, Kenya, uh, Ghana, of course, has gone there about twice to the markets to, to borrow money. Uh, you're raising a very important point, because uh, the coupon rates, initially they were around 6%, but that's when these economies were doing reasonably well, but with now quantitative easing and, uh, and uh, coming to an end, uh, you have seen that uh, money is uh, scarcer, and the coupon rates have gone up to to eight, even uh, even higher. Now, that in a way, you could say that African markets are making a point. They they are making a point. The point being that they can go to alternative markets. They have some kind of rating. It's not very high, but it can be improved. But on the other hand, if as I was saying before, uh, if the treasury rates are at half percent, and you are borrowing at eight point five percent, that is too high and really uh, it's going to be very difficult to my mind to find the investments, uh, the, the end investments, be it in terms of infrastructure, that have such a high return that you could, you could profitably uh, make money. But it's hoped that things will improve and that at some stage uh, when uh, the rates are lower, uh, they could trade in these much more expensive rates for much cheaper rates. That is uh, definitely uh, the hope. Uh, and I'm hoping also that our, our economic managers today are much, a much smarter lot 
and that we won't let ourselves uh, go back to the old problem where uh, Africa was so heavily indebted that uh, a lot of uh, there are some cases where the African airlines were grounded as soon as they arrived in Europe because of all those days. I don't think we'll go back to that level. But we need to be careful to know exactly what are we, what kind of investments are we going to, to put in when we're borrowing at next to 10% on our debt. Okay, I hope that went well. No. You're almost uh, cured. Yeah, it, it, it sounds an email, <laughs> but there's more questions, but I said, but it's okay. Yeah, no, uh, but I think, I think we have, uh, because I... I, yeah. I